a dorsal incision is made in line with the third metacarpal and centered directly over Lister's tubercle. Skin flaps are elevated, protecting cutaneous nerves. The extensor retinaculum is exposed and reflected from radial to ulnar from the first extensor compartment to the fifth or sixth extensor compartment. The distal part of the retinaculum can be used to reinforce the dorsal wrist capsule. A distal-based rectangular-shaped wrist capsular flap is reflected from proximal to distal. Step 1. Locate the PGT guide so that it is positioned over Lister's tubercle and rests firmly on the dorsal surface of the distal radius. Assemble the PGT tab component to the radial block and mount it onto the PGT guide. Insert the tab into the radiocarpal joint, positioning it against the lunate fossa. Secure the PGT guide to the radius with 2 mm K wires. Confirm position of the PGT guide with X-ray imaging. Remove the PGT tab. Step 2. Insert the PGT carpal cutting guide into the PGT guide and tighten in place. The position of the carpal cutting guide should be established based upon a preoperative assessment using an X-ray template. Place the carpal cutting guide across the wrist and align with the third metacarpal. Typically, the lunate, triquetrum, proximal scaphoid, and head of the capitate are resected. If the carpal cutting guide is placed correctly, the cut should be perpendicular to the long axis of the forearm. Resect the carpal bones with an oscillating saw. Remove the carpal cutting guide from the PGT guide. Step 3. Insert the PGT radial resurfacing guide into the PGT guide. Tighten at the proper height to adequately contour the scaphoid and lunate fossa. The PGT radial burr should remove excess bone on the radial fossa and central ridge between the scaphoid and lunate fossa. Care should be taken not to remove too much bone and not to resect subchondral bone as a press fit application is desired. Remove the radial resurfacing guide. Insert the PGT radial pilot template into the PGT guide. The radial pilot template should sit firmly against the prepared surface of the distal radius. The radial pilot template may be adjusted dorsal and palmarly to achieve correct dorsal palmar alignment. Place the 2 mm guide pin into the radius. Remove the template. Confirm the position of the guide pin with imaging by planar x-rays. The cannulated PGT radial counterbore drill is used to create a pilot hole for broaching. Broach the distal radius over the guide pin. Broach to the correct size of the radial implant, which is determined from preoperative templating and size match at time of surgery. Based upon the preoperative assessment, the distal radius is broached with increasing sized brooches to allow full seating of the radial component. Care should be taken to make sure the angle of the brooch is aligned with the long axis of the radius. The brooch may need to be withdrawn to clean the teeth and clear the intramedullary cavity of debris. Burring may be needed in the radial styloid region to prevent ulnar migration of the brooch during impaction. Insert the radial trial into the prepared canal and impact the trial until seated. Evaluate the fit of the component against the scaphoid and lunate fossa as well as the dorsal peripheral ridge. The implant should fit snug or flush against the dorsal ridge of the distal radius. If the fit is satisfactory, remove the trial component by engaging the extraction holes with a gelpie retractor. If the trial is proud, Further broaching or selective burring of the distal radius is needed. Step 4. Position the PGT carpal template over the capitate and third metacarpal. Drill the K-wire to the depth of the carpal post length of the implant size that was preoperatively assessed. If trial reduction is desired using the carpal template, then cut the wire and place the carpal ball trial over the carpal template. If desired, the carpal template can be used to prepare the pilot holes for the screws. Use the PGT metacarpal drill guide to assist in alignment over the second and fourth metacarpals. Use of radiography at this point is recommended to ensure proper positioning. 
Pre-drill with a 2 mm drill bit through the carpal template into the distal scaphoid in preparation of carpal screw placement. Crossing the second carpo-metacarpal joint is an option that many surgeons prefer to do. The second carpal screw is pre-drilled through the length of the hamate but not across the fourth carpo-metacarpal joint. The carpal brooch is used to widen the canal through the capitate. The brooch has three lines which correspond with a small, medium, and large size component. Insert the brooch fully to the appropriate line. The stem of the carpal trial component is inserted into the capitate. Using fluoroscopy, verify that the dorsal aspect and the length of the trial component is positioned correctly. Step 5. If the pilot holes for the screws were not prepared using the PGT carpal template, they can be prepared using the carpal trial and the PGT metacarpal drill guide. This can be accomplished using the same method described earlier. Remove the trial components. Step 6. Insert the radial implant and press fit in place. Using the radial impactor, tap the implant until fully seated. In treating patients with osteoporotic bone, bone graft or cement may be used. Insert carpal component and press fit. It is aligned with the centering hole in the capitate and pushed or tapped into place. Accurately measure the required radial and ulnar screw lengths with a depth gauge. The self-tapping screws are inserted through the carpal plate and into the holes created by the 2 mm drill bit with a 2.5 mm hex driver. Use imaging to determine that the screws are the correct length. The screws can cross the second carpometacarpal joint, but not the fourth carpometacarpal joint. The screws are then tightened into place. The polyethylene carpal ball is now placed onto the distal component and snapped into place using the carpal ball impactor. The total wrist joint is articulated and stability assessed. An extra length polyethylene ball may be indicated if there is residual dorsal palmar laxity or instability. Assess range of motion through radio ulnar deviation and flexion extension of the wrist. If range of motion is satisfactory, standard wound closure is performed at this time. Repair the dorsal capsule back to the soft tissue on the distal edge of the distal radius. If the capsule is thin at this area, reinforce the capsule with the distal half of the extensor retinaculum with non-resorbable 2O or 3O sutures. Repair the proximal portion of the extensor retinaculum over the extensor tendons in the usual fashion, without including the extensor pollicis longus tendon, which can be left extra retinacular to prevent tendon irritation or rupture.